If you think it could be helpful, would you say how it is that moment-to-moment -moment mindfulness brings about the concentration? Well, if there is actually the mindfulness of each moment, that means that the mind is totally focused. And when the mind is totally focused, it's concentrated. So, mindfulness brings concentration. And without mindfulness, we can't concentrate. Also, one can say that moment-to-moment -moment mindfulness eliminates random thought and distraction, exactly what we're after in the meditation. I've been following the breath at the chest for 20 years. Although I get more concentrated with metta, I find the sensations at the nose hard to feel. Is there a big difference in these two objects of concentration? Well, yes, obviously there's a big difference in the objects of concentration, but I think what the question actually is trying to say is, um, can one get concentrated on either one of these? Yes. The Buddha taught 40 different methods of meditation and one can get concentrated on any one of them. We just don't have the time to discuss or try out 40 different methods. It becomes far too confusing and so we use those which are most useful for the most people. But some people can't get concentrated on the breath. It, it's their own individual tendency. It happens again and again. So if the feeling of loving kindness is a good um, method of concentration, yes, of course, use it. And use it to the point where you can actually stay with it. One doesn't have to use the breath. It's only one of many methods. And we'll also do another method tomorrow, which is helpful for people who can't use the breath very well. And if one has been meditating for 20 years, one can assume, mostly, it's mostly correct, that concentration is there. And that one can go from the loving-kindness method to full, of full concentration, which brings the meditative absorption. If and when the concentration on loving-kindness becomes very um, profound and actually happens without distracting thought, there will be a feeling of warmth and sometimes a feeling of expansion from the center of the chest, from the spiritual heart. If that happens, go to that feeling. No longer think about what and whom and how to love, but just go to the feeling. Is it counterproductive on a retreat to take a brisk 20 to 30 minute walk every day or two? No, oh, that's fine. Especially if mindfulness is present during the walk. And mindfulness can be very much present if, for instance, one goes very fast and has to really keep one's mind on what the body is doing. It can be very helpful. It can also be helpful because it counteracts the sitting. 
So if one is inclined that way, yes, why not? But with mindfulness. When meditating, I'm not bothered by a random noise. Birds hopping on the roof, someone coughing, but repeated noise, a watch ticking, a lawnmower, even the pump outside the zendo that goes on and off at predictable intervals is terribly distracting. Suggestions. Yes, certainly. No end of suggestions from the Buddha. When one finds oneself extremely sensitive to noises, one has to practice. One has absolutely no alternative. One has to practice noise only. Now, the ear can only hear noise. The ear does not know that it's a lawnmower, a watch, a, or a pump. The ear has absolutely no knowledge of that. It's all in the mind. So what we can practice is just hearing noise. It's not easy, but very valuable, because we get a much better insight into how we function. All our sense contacts, every one of them, is translated in the mind and immediately responded to with like or dislike. Now in this case, one would assume that since it is terribly distracting, one is responding with dislike. No need to. We don't have to react. We don't even have to know that it's a pump. We don't even have to know that it's a lawnmower or a watch. All we have to know is noise. And when we do that several times, the noise sort of dissolves within oneself and there is no longer any need to resist it. And when there's no resistance, when flows, the whole thing flows with it, then it's no distraction. It's a very valuable um, learning situation. It's a very valuable way of getting to know how all these sense contacts are interpreted. And we can even practice that with all our other sense contacts. But it happens that Noise is the easiest one to practice with. And also, in the case of meditation, the most valuable one, because if one reacts like this, it is terribly distracting. And since pumps and watches have a habit of continuing, one may be distracted for the rest of this week. So you are practicing loving and understand the present moment, being in the moment. Then all of a sudden someone hits your thumb with a big hammer. We had that this morning. <laughs> or you get incredibly hungry. Can you still have Buddha mind? Well, the question comes to mind, what's Buddha mind? What is it? Is it enlightened mind? Sure, if somebody's enlightened, they attain enlightened mind. doesn't matter if somebody hits them with a hammer. It's quite all right. Or is it unenlightened mind? If it's unenlightened mind, sure, one retains unenlightened mind. I honestly and truly don't know what's Buddha mind. It sounds as if we're enlightened mind. Well, if it is, sure. Enlightened keeps enlightened. 
I really don't know what it's supposed to mean, Buddha mind. But we did discuss this, this, this hammer business this morning, didn't we? <laughs> and came to some conclusions about it. That the pain is there, but it only becomes real dukkha if one dislikes the pain. And that's unenlightened mind. What is your viewpoint on meditation and depression? I like to say to that before I go on with the question that my personal viewpoint is really of no consequence whatsoever. The only thing that is of any interest and of any consequence is, is the Buddha's teaching. So I try to stay out of it as much as I can. And all I do is just voice what the Buddha has uh, taught us. So that's viewpoint. An article by Levi in Tricycle magazine believes spirit, sorry, believes meditation may also be harmful. The depressed person should be treated medically. Possible. Depends how depressed that person is. Can be so depressed that they need clinical attention. There's no way of knowing. Um, but one can say to that, that if a person is suffering from depression, it's hardly likely that they can meditate. So I don't think that the question actually arises. If the mind is not joyful, they can't meditate anyway. They might like to try, that's possible, but they won't be able to do it. Um, there is a thing, which I, or an organization, which I think is called Spiritual Emergency Network or something similar. Yeah, is it right what I got there? Okay. Hmm? Yes. So if somebody is having that kind of problem, there appear to be people around that deal with that. So I don't know. I haven't read the article. I don't get um, that magazine. So I don't know what it says. But two things are sure. There is help available and also there is no way one can meditate when one is depressed. And being treated medically depends on the kind and the strength of the depression. You talk about remaining in the present, present moment, I think it says, and that one can plan for the future, but not dwell on it. Regarding one's work or profession, can you speak about how one finds right livelihood and how to recognize it when it appears. <laughs> uh, right livelihood, very um, simply explained, is the kind of earning a living where the five precepts are being kept. Now, the most difficult precepts to keep when you are engaged in a commercial enterprise is the fourth one, right speech, and the second one, not taking anything that wasn't given. But if one makes an effort to um, live by the five precepts and earn one's living with the five precepts in mind, one has right livelihood. And one can recognize it when one is offered something by looking at it from that angle. If you look at it from that angle, look at the five precepts and see that they are well observed in that particular enterprise, then one can try it out. The right speech one is the one that in the uh, competitive commercial world 
is um, broken as a matter of course and is not recognized as being broken and if it's not recognized of course one should refrain from joining that I think that's the one that's the most difficult one not taking what what is not given in a commercial sense that often means that one has to honor bills and obligations immediately and not wait till somebody urges one you've talked about the importance of the Buddha and the Dhamma what are your comments on the value of the Sangha I have deliberately refrained from mentioning the Sangha because I have noticed that particularly here in California the word Sangha is being used in a way which we are not used to so there is apparently great confusion what is Sangha I have noticed that the word Sangha is used here for everybody who sits on a pillow well we take refuge in the Sangha I'm not going to take refuge in everybody who sits on a pillow the refuge we take in the Sangha concerns those people who have become enlightened through the Buddha's teaching and have been able to continue giving them to us so that they are available even today they are the propagators of the Dhamma in that sense that Sangha the other sense that we use Sangha for are the people who have been ordained but that is not what we take refuge in because what's a robe? nothing it's just a piece of cloth so we take refuge in those who became enlightened and have been able to propagate the Dhamma so that it's available to us but since the word Sangha and I've heard it several times since I've come to California this time and last time also is being used here in a totally different sense I refrained from using it because I didn't want to go into any big explanations um, what Sangha really is but if we have now that I'm being asked of course I will uh, respond to it and if it is taken in the sense I have just explained then of course loving those people who have been able not only to become enlightened but to pass on the value of the Dhamma to us is also a great boon to our hearts do you agree with the statement if we are abused we are at least useful to somebody the answer is no I don't um, we should then have sympathetic joy for the person who abused us but is it not a danger if we don't react and are joyful that that person will continue to abuse us and others I have never heard such a statement I cannot recall to have seen it in any sutta but maybe my memory is failing me I don't know but um, what I remember the Buddha saying is that if somebody abuses us we have compassion for that person we don't have sympathetic joy with something which is obviously unwholesome abuse is always unwholesome it doesn't matter what kind and by whom and towards whom it can be very unwholesome if it is done um, towards a person who has already gained a foothold on the path it can be extremely unwholesome and because unwholesome action or unwholesome speech probably in this uh, context has unwholesome results no matter what 
compassion is the kind of required emotion. Anger would be foolish because if we get angry, we're only hurting ourselves. We're making ourselves unhappy. And most people do get angry at abuse. But sympathetic joy, that doesn't sound right, nor does it sound logical. If we are the target of that abuse, it doesn't mean that we are useful. It just means that the person who likes to abuse somebody has found a target, that's all. And we've all found targets, not necessarily of abuse, but of anger. And what can that possibly benefit us? What can that benefit anyone? Abuse is negative and unwholesome, and therefore it will go out into the world as a negative, unwholesome emotion. And as it goes out into the world as that, it will be contacted by many people's consciousness. So if anybody gets abusive, they are adding to the suffering in the world. So the only thing to do is to have compassion at that time for someone who's obviously unhappy because a happy person doesn't go around abusing anybody. A person who's unhappy can easily fall into that trap. So, compassion for an unhappy person. Thus, slowing down, being gentle with one's body while eating or walking, paying attention to the details, help one be able to do the same with their feelings or to be able to be present for the feelings of others. Well, if slowing down is not based on laziness or tiredness or lack of energy, but based on mindfulness and being gentle is based on mindfulness and um, while eating or walking, then certainly it helps one also to be aware of feelings of oneself and in others. It's all a matter of <coughs> being mindful. It depends how and why one is slowing down. It can be one may be slowing down because there's sickness in the body, then it's not very helpful. Only if one is mindful, then it can be very helpful. Let's say a drunken man ran over two people and killed them, but had no intention of doing so. Is there karma associated with the action? If so, what? Well, what happens from the law when a drunken man kills two people? Does he go scot-free or does something happen to him? The difference between murder and manslaughter. Our laws are the very gross expression of karmic resultants. It's the same thing. When I do loving meditation, I feel sadness because all my experience with loving, even the good experiences, have always had something missing. The sadness distracts me and I lose my concentration. Please comment and help me to the next step. The experiences with loving were geared towards results, as we always do. We love somebody, so we want the result of being loved back. 
We want the result of having a wonderful relationship of some sort. Something that was missing was the purity and with that comes ecstasy. That's missing. If one wants something back from loving. And most people, practically everybody does. So, when love means nothing else except opening one's heart and giving one's oneself, there can be no sadness. It's just the generosity of the heart. And generosity of the heart has never made anybody sad. But not getting the results one wants makes everybody sad. So these are the experiences that most people have had in their lives. What are the jhana states? Meditative absorptions. How do you know when you're in one? Four of the seven factors of enlightenment are the first four jhanas. So after we have managed to get through the first three, we're still on the first one, I will certainly explain the other four, which are the jhanas. And I will explain it in detail. But if, by any chance, this question means that the person who is asking it has some inkling that they might have, through full concentration, become absorbed, I will say this. It's a delightful sensation. Utterly beautiful, quite absorbing. And if it isn't utterly delightful, it's not the first jhana. But if it is utterly delightful, go to it and stay with it. Go to the feeling and stay with it. Were you a meditative mother? Possibly, but I think what is meant is a meditating mother. Um, meditative, I hope I was, I have no idea. When your children were young, if so, please share your wisdom with other mothers and fathers. Um, I started meditating when the youngest child was, let's see, six. So not when they were very small. I must say that when they were very small, I'd never heard the word meditation. It was a bit different then. That youngest child is now 40, so it's a while ago. In those days, meditation was hard to come by. And uh, I certainly tried. I often found myself distracted because there were many duties, far more duties than one normally is concerned with because we lived on a farm on a self-supporting, biologically um, cultivated farm. But one thing which is important and of interest to mothers of young children, the fear that all mothers go through because of their children, because of their health, and also their tendency to do things which are life-threatening, particularly, usually, little boys <laughs> do things which one can't explain why. <laughs> <laughs> but they keep on doing them. <laughs> the thing that one needs to do if one has 
uh, small children and is worried and anxious about their well-being and there isn't, I think there are very few mothers alive that aren't, is to learn to let go. It's the biggest lesson. And if one has learned to let go of one's own children, one knows what letting go means. And then letting go can become the focus of the spiritual life because it's a key to spiritual evolution. And letting go doesn't mean that one shoves them off to some other place where they don't bother one. It doesn't mean that at all. It means letting go of ownership. Intellectually, everybody knows they're not mine, but feelingly, very few people do. So it's the letting go of the ownership of the child, recognizing their own karma, being caring and attentive, but not trying to impose one's own ideas of what the results should be. Quite difficult, usually takes a few years, but immensely beneficial to both the parents and the child. And one can usually not start when they're very small because they um, need an awful lot of attention. But one can certainly start when they're about 10 because they become very self-sufficient then already. And if one starts right then and there because one is sick and tired of being worried about them, that's the way to do it. And I can assure you, it works. And it works for both sides. It works for the peace of mind for the mother and the peace of mind for the child. There's far less aggression, far less resistance, because the child feels quite without a doubt that although the best is being provided, it isn't being pushed at the child. It's there and being offered. And as that goes to the point of the letting go, then fears are eliminated and love can flow without the hindrance of wanting something to happen because of that love. It's a great hindrance. So that is maybe what it means to be a meditative mother. Before I start with the questions, there are a few things I'd like to say about our daily activity. Interviews. If you haven't yet found out that your name is on one of the sheets there, please do. If you deliberately don't come, Please tell the person that is expecting you that you're not coming. They're sitting there waiting for you. Three haven't come so far, as far as I know. Either you didn't know or you didn't want to go. If you don't want to go, nobody's forcing you. But please let the person know that you're not coming. Sleepiness seems to be a great problem, not just for one or two, but for several people. Open your eyes, look at the light, give yourself a pep talk, pull your earlobes, rub your cheeks, and remember, sleeping is a proper activity for bed. And since most people die in bed, it's not such a desirable activity anyway. <laughs> this course will be over before you know it. Use the time to the best advantage. Don't waste your time comparing what you've heard or read before and what you're hearing now, just do it. 
and then, as of Saturday noon, start comparing. <laughs> you can't compare what you don't know. So first do it, and then go ahead after you've done it, which will be as of Saturday noon. You've got plenty of time then, the whole coming year, or next 10 years to compare. And also, it comes up in one, in one of the questions, but please use these questions in order to find out more about your practice as it concerns what the Buddha taught. Practice is all that counts. Mental convolutions are old hat. Everybody knows how to do that. It's not interesting. What's interesting is, is how to practice. So when you write down the question, first ask yourself, will this help me to practice? Will I understand meditation better? Will I understand the Buddha's teaching better if I get an answer to this? Or why am I asking? And if the answer is yes, of course, I will understand the Buddha's teaching better if I get an answer to this, or my meditation will be better or easier to do, or I can understand better what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to do it, go right ahead and ask it. The Buddha always welcomed questions, but he had four ways of answering them. The first kind was with yes or no. The second way to answer was with a long explanation. The third kind was with a counter question. And the fourth kind of answer was silence. Now can you imagine why? It wasn't his interest to please people. His interest was to teach them how to be truly happy. When you ask questions, please remember, is this going to make me truly happy? And if the answer is yes, of course, write it down, ask it, ask two or three questions, it doesn't matter how many, but find out the reason why you're asking. That too means using the time to the best advantage. The time we spend together here is very short-lived. It may never recur. Use it. Don't dream things up. And you will know in a moment why I say that. or maybe some of you know already. It seems to me that Buddhist meditation is more practiced in Germany and Great Britain. Great Britain. If that is so, why do you think so? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't even know what's being practiced in America. The only state in America I've ever been to is California, and that lately only very intermittently. And I have no idea what's being done here. So I can't say, and I presume the question means more than in America. I don't know. It seems to have been proven that a moderate intake of alcohol considerably reduces the risk of heart attack. <laughs> the medical establishment now even advises two or three glasses of red wine daily the fifth precept in question mark. I don't really believe in the medical establishment, <laughs> but I do believe in the Buddha. And this thing here has a second part to it. May I add a word to my question about drinking? My guess is that the average non-drinker tends to be a compulsive perfectionist personality who is more likely to have a heart attack anyway. Do you agree? 
this is very important to find out why am I asking this question. I mean, I can guess, but why? Find out yourself, whoever asked it. Please find out why you asked it. And uh, it's not difficult to guess. In the middle of breathing or metta concentration, a nasty thought arises. Do you try to substitute then or do you go back to the breathing? Going back to the breath is the substitution. It's either thinking or being attentive to the breath. If the thinking is there and we substitute with attention on the breath, we have substituted. That's what we're learning in meditation, to substitute that which is not particularly appropriate at the time with that which is totally appropriate. However, if one can't get back to the breath, well, yes, one can substitute with a different thought, which might make it easier to get back to the breath. Ah. Are your teachings available in the Bay Area on a regular basis? Do you have a yearly schedule of retreats? Is there a mailing list or can, can, or can one be on, sorry, sorry. is there a mailing list one can be on to get the schedule? Well, I think you probably have seen, or if you haven't, you can have a look, that Lee is um, offering a meditation sittings once a week, and at that time also my tapes will be played so that you have the teaching there. And he also has the mailing list so in his computer, so you can get on that. And... Um, there's also a um, piece of paper there saying when my next English course will be. So if you haven't had a look, do have a look. Would you explain by example how you can tell the difference between indifference and, and compassion? Well, I think it's a, a misunderstanding or forgetfulness Indifference is the near enemy of equanimity and compassion has as its near enemy pity. And the difference between indifference and compassion should not even be a topic. And if a person is indifferent, they don't care. And if a person is compassionate, they do. But the difference which is difficult to see is equanimity and indifference. That's the one where outwardly they appear alike, but inwardly there's an enormous difference because equanimity is always imbued and coupled with loving kindness and compassion, whereas indifference is putting a barrier around oneself, not wanting to know not wanting to experience because it can become unpleasant. So it's very often that only the person who is practicing equanimity may know whether they have equanimity or indifference. Equanimity is even-mindedness, not becoming totally upset nor a totally um, passionate about anything. That's even-mindedness. What is the kind of Buddhist teachings you teach? Well, I hope the correct ones. <laughs> My tradition is called Theravada. Theravada. Vada is a teaching, Thera the elders. The elders doesn't mean age, it means a long time in the Sangha. And... Um, as in um, uh, different from Mahayana, which is, um, includes Zen and Tibetan teaching, that's Mahayana. And Mahayana means the great vehicle. And there's a wonderful story 
and I have uh, sort of stolen it from Paul Reps. It's in one of his books. And uh, somebody was asking him about this nomin uh, denominations of differences. Now, Theravada is usually called Hinayana by the Mahayanas. Mahayana means great vehicle, Hinayana means small vehicle. But it doesn't mean small, it means expense. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's worthwhile remembering that. <laughs> and I wish some more people would tell that. <laughs> I very much enjoy sharing an environment where two different spiritual practices are being practiced. My mind is curious, though, what is the significance of the sounds that seem to be such a part of the Zen community's practice? All I can say is please ask the Zen people. Also, why is it that chanting in Theravada as well as in Zen is largely monotone? It's, um, it's a chanting, it's not singing. And chanting is monotone. It's not supposed to be music. It's supposed to be a recitation of the teaching. I was completely focused on the bird's distress until he or she escaped during the 7 a.m. sitting. Can you say something about this? Yes, certainly. Any distraction will do. <laughs> <laughs> Since my San Diego Sangha can no longer be, we are not fully enlightened, may we refer to ourselves by our secondary name, the Bagel Buddhas. Well, yes, very nice and Jewish, but not really appropriate. San Diego Meditation Group sounds better. I'm surprised to hear you use the word emotion for Vedana. My understanding from practice and study is that emotion is a mental formation, really, a content of the mind, and that feelings are but three, attraction, aversion, indifference, or neutral. Feelings are three, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Attraction and aversion and indifference are reactions, not feelings. They are the reaction. So the whole thing's completely mixed up. But what I will do is try to sort it out for the person who's asking this. I wonder whether that will um, be successful. Feelings are three. And when we talk about the five khandas, of which four are mental, the f aggregates, the five aggregates of which we consist, there's one is the body. We're not talking about that, so we're talking about four mental ones. We're talking about sense contact, which is always followed by feeling, which is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, which is followed by perception and followed by reaction, mental formation. That may be, and always, usually is, either attraction or aversion or indifference. That's not the feeling, that's a reaction. However, when we talk about the foundations of mindfulness, we no longer talk about the aggregates of the khandas. In Sanskrit, skandhas, Pali, khandas, English, aggregates, doesn't mean anything, but if we know what they are, we do, they are meaningful. We are no longer talking about them. We are talking about that, on which we can put our attention. And obviously, emotions are a very important part of ourselves to put our attention on. So in that particular aspect, we are having the first foundation of mindfulness being the body. The second foundation of mindfulness being either the emotions or the physical sensations. The third one, the moods, and the, first, the fourth one, content of mind. Whether we say that our emotions are part of mind or not, 
doesn't make any difference at all. The Buddha only has one word which depicts heart and mind, chitta, I said that already, but if you are much better off dividing that into two because it's easier for us to deal with. So when we divide it into two, we wind up with the emotional aspect of ourselves, heart, and the logical, analytical aspect of ourselves, mind. If we like, we can put it all into one basket and say it's all mental formations, sure. It's not quite as clear and not quite as easy to deal with because why is an emotion a mental formation? An emotion is more likely a heart formation. For us, that's much easier to deal with. So the difference which exists is the one when we talk about the aggregates or about the foundations of mindfulness. And attraction, aversion, and indifference are certainly reactions and not the three feelings. So it's not so easy, is it, to get it all sorted out? The best thing to do is to do it. I hate to admit that. I love to gossip. What are Buddha's teachings? What might scare or shame me enough to drop this dreadful habit of wrong speech? Well, my suggestion is that because it's difficult to drop a habit just right then and there, just gossip about nice things, about the good aspects of anybody. Of course, the word gossip really implies the other, ki the other kind, but why not change it to just talking about the nice things about people? And that's already um, quite all right then. It doesn't uh, have that uh, connotation that one is talking badly about people. You tell us that the Buddha says that the me needs to get out of our way. How then do we teach self-esteem to the child? We don't teach the child to get the me out of the way, although we do teach children not to be so self-centered. In other words, share your chocolate. Don't eat it all yourself. And be nice to the kid next door, even if you don't like it so much. A child needs a good and healthy upbringing. We are all born <clears throat> with the me aspect within us, otherwise we wouldn't be here. It's impossible to be born if there is no craving. And the craving is the me wanting to be here. Whatever that me happens to be at the time, it's not the question. So every child that is around has uh, usually a pretty healthy me, and it uh, needs to be taught to be at least sharing, which is difficult enough for little kids. Getting to a profound understanding of absolute truth is not a teaching for small children. A profound understanding of absolute truth is even too difficult for most adults. Uh, do you have any suggestions about what to do when sitting and intense physical sensations um, arise when, also uh, to do when sitting and intense physical sensations arise, like leg pains or hunger? Well, hunger, maybe eat more for breakfast, I don't know. But um, leg pains can be, I've already talked about that, they can be a great teacher, but they shouldn't be, um, one should not stay with them if the mind becomes negative. As soon as the mind becomes negative, it's useless. I mean, we're negative enough without adding to it through meditation. So the first use it as a teacher, and I have already explained that, recognizing the four aggregates, touch, contact, feeling, unpleasant in this case, perception, saying pain, reaction, I can't stand it, I don't like it, it's awful, it's probably cutting off my blood circulation, 
must be unhealthy <laughs> and so on goes on and on and on why do people do it and so forth <laughs> going back to instead of moving immediately going back to the touch contact and recognizing the four aggregates having experienced the four aggregates nobody remains in any doubt what they are they are touch contact in this t- play, uh, case we have other sense contacts this is touch its feeling its perception its reaction so going back to it and experiencing it knowing what happens without the personal experience the whole thing remains a theoretical model it often does it's so easy to experience just sit five minutes longer than you wanted to and you've got it go back to the actual experience and then having experienced it don't react with the mental formation with the reaction of dislike but go back to the breath and anybody and everybody can do that once twice three times for a moment and then the mind says it's all very interesting four mental kandas how nice but i can't sit like that <laughs> that's fine don't move but don't do it without having known that we always try to escape from dukkha by getting away from it and don't do it without having known the four steps which follow each other it's perfectly right to move it's much worse to sit there with negative reactions negativity is a great enemy so then if having moved the um uh, unpleasant sensation does not disappear then the sweeping can be very helpful you can go from the um top of the head quickly through the body to that particular pr- uh, place in the body which has the unpleasant sensation and focus on it very strongly and try to go out with that unpleasant sensation through the skin at that particular place just like we go out through the fingertips and the tips of the toes just go out at that place and you can do that 10 times 20 times it will at least relieve it if not completely change it but it will relieve it if that is necessary after you have moved hunger i suggest to eat a little more i live in a small town in california how could i go about becoming your student well the first thing to do in that small town in california is to start a meditation group and play my tapes in that group once a week and two people are a group and i will talk about that on the last day because this is one of the important aspects of daily or um everyday living when we want to continue practice to have a group or to be in a group get others interested don't do missionary work but invite them and uh, if you can afford it come to wherever courses are being held by me in english unfortunately usually entails uh, a fair bit of money for the trip but that's just the way things are <laughs> you talked about a mother letting go of that of a child how can i practice that and that's an uh, one of the most important practices for mothers um it will if it's done properly and successfully it will remove the um difficulty in the relationship and it will remove a lot of fear and it will remove a lot of stress in these close relationships 
that we find in the family. The only way that it really works is to contemplate the death of a child. How it would be if and what the reaction will be of the mother. Now, some people think, mistakenly of course, that if they contemplate that, they are aiding the appearance of death. If we were that accomplished, that would mean we would have enormous mental powers. And we would then also be able to get our own death happening exactly when we want it. Hardly likely, is it? So the contemplation of the death of that, what we absolutely want to keep, is a way to learn about its transiency, its impermanence, its non-belonging, its not mine, and it has its own karma. It takes a fair bit of doing. One doesn't do that overnight, but there is no other way of letting go of this very, very strong attachment. You mentioned the Buddha taught over 40 kinds of meditation. I get the impression when you speak that you're not just reporting, but that you've experienced the things you talk about. Have you practiced all 40 kinds of meditation? No, I haven't. Uh, do you think it true that different cultures and different times, not to mention different temperaments, are more suited to particular kinds of meditation practice. <coughs> the, uh, the thing is that the meditation practices, which are all mentioned in the Satipatthana Sutta, sound, some of them sound impossible. But all we have to do is translate the words into our everyday experience and then they're perfectly understandable and you can see that they would be useful. Now there are 40 different kinds because quite a number of them are for insight. The most used ones, the most traditional ones for calm are breath, loving kindness and the casinas. Now the casinas are color discs and there are nine color, colors mentioned, but mostly people find their own preference. Color discs are very useful for becoming calm for people who have absolutely no way of staying with the breath. But since there are more people who can stay with the breath than those that can stay with the color disc, we usually use the breath. It's impossible to go from one meditation to another. Certainly, there are different uh, tendencies in people. And if the tendency shows itself by a spontaneous arising of a color disc, the same color again and again, quite steady, then that means the tendency is in that direction. It's a person that's very visually inclined. There are people who can't do anything with calm meditation. They have to have inside meditation. For that, there are nine different cemetery meditations. Well, if we go to a cemetery here in the West, all we see is tombstones. When we go to a cemetery in the East, even today, we will find bare bones. We will find uh, corpses that are getting, uh, being made ready for cremation. And that kind of thing, of course, we can't do here. But one of the things that all monks and nuns do, and of course it's much easier to do in the East than in the West, I don't even know if it's possible here, um, we go to a mortuary where the uh, bodies, body or bodies, have not been prepared in any manner or form, but are in their natural state of death. And some are already starting to disintegrate. It helps. Most young monks and young nuns, when they do that for the first time, get sick to their tummy. Understandably so. 
these are all called meditations. There are nine different ones, cemetery meditations. Uh, impossible to recommend those because we can't look at bones that have bits and pieces of flesh on and that type of thing. That's one of them. Uh, we have one meditation, which is the parts of the body, which I have translated into a way which we can do, uh, which is um, understandable and easy to follow. So some of these, yes, of course, but nobody does all the different colors. It's not necessary. If you become calm on one color or on the breath, that will do. They're all, they're meditation, and I think most of you, and the questions show that, don't know the difference between samatha and vipassana. And most of you, I think, from the, from the uh, questions, and also from those that you've asked your interview partner, think that Vipassana is a name of a meditation. I have already said it wasn't, but I will do it again. I'll read the next question, which is about the same thing. Could you say something about how pursuing the absorptions relates to other Vipassana emphasis? The principal teacher, for me, has n made no mention of this aspect. That's to be expected. That's unfortunately what happens today. There are, as, I, as you've just heard and as we've said, 40 different methods taught by the Buddha of meditation. There are many more methods. And I have seen a book where there were 113 methods mentioned. Not a Buddhist book, but also methods of meditation. But a method is a method by any name. Method remains method. There are only two directions in meditation. And I think if you can get that clear and nothing else, that's already a very important step. So please listen to this. There are only two directions in meditation, no matter where you go, no matter what you learn, no matter who you talk to. And they are in Pali, samatha and vipassana. These are Pali words. And the first one means tranquility, and the second one means insight. So if you have the idea that vipassana is a kind of meditation, it's a wrong idea. Vipassana, insight, is what we hope to gain once we've become calm. It's a third step. The Buddha's teaching is divided into three parts. In Pali, sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila, moral conduct. Samadhi, same thing as samatha, concentration. Panya, same thing as vipassana, wisdom, wisdom insight. Panya is wisdom, vipassana is insight, both mean the same thing. Those three aspects of the teaching exist, nothing else. Everything that you hear, everything that you hopefully practice, is either one of the three. Either you're practicing moral conduct, or you're practicing concentration, where you become calm, or you're practicing insight. You can't do all of it at once, but you can certainly do it together as a practice. Now. I have over and over again smiled at these advertisements of Vipassana retreats. I do hope everybody gets Vipassana. It'd be wonderful. That means everybody gets insight. But that's all it means, the word Vipassana. And what has happened is that the middle step, the bridge between moral conduct and wisdom insight, has been left to its own devices. If it happens, wonderful. Sometimes one is even told to go back to the breath. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't seem to be important. It's a misunderstanding which comes out of the fact that we don't have a long, thousand-year-old tradition of meditation in the West. This tradition of meditation is not beginning with the Buddha. 
The first time we can find it is in the Rig Vedas, which are 5,000 years old. The Buddha took them over and added his own insights to it. So what we are actually practicing, and we'll talk about sila, moral conduct, at the very end of the course, not because it stands at the end of the teaching, but because from personal experience, most people are more able to handle that when they've been in a course for a week or more. So sila comes at the end. But we're practicing samatha and vipassana. I've said that before, but I know how difficult it is to remember these things. But now, please, try to remember. Samatha is staying on the breath. Vipassana is knowing what you're thinking. And we're doing both. If you can stay on the breath, you will obviously go into the absorptions. If you can't stay on the breath, you've got to label the distraction. Labeling the distraction is inside. Vipassana. I don't know where all this confusion comes from, but um, it's really important for every meditator to know that these are the two directions and nothing else exists. Now, that the middle thing, the bridge between one, between sila, between moral conduct and in, uh, wisdom inside, has been eliminated and just being used to get a bit of concentration on the breath is probably, I'm only guessing, due to the fact that in Burma the Abhidhamma is king. I can't say whether that is so or not. I imagine that is so. And the Abhidhamma, of course, is strictly for inside. And so it has been said many times by many people that it is necessary only to have, well, sometimes even moral conduct isn't mentioned. I've read several books about that here, about American happenings. Um, so let's forget about moral conduct for the moment. We'll do that at the, on the last day. And the only thing that appears to have any significance is wisdom insight. Sure, that's a goal. But how does one get it? Now, there's only one answer to that. The Buddha practiced samatha and then vipassana. And the Buddha taught samatha and then vipassana. He's taught samatha, samadhi, and then wisdom insight, panya. Sila, samadhi, and panya. That's what the Noble Eightfold Path consists of. It's got three parts, sila, samadhi, and panya. And there's no getting away from it. My teacher told me numbers of years ago that it is becoming samatha, samadhi, is becoming a lost art. And one can say that without a shadow of a doubt, it has become a lost art. But that doesn't mean we can't revive it. And all of you who are doing it know the value of why it ought to be revived. It changes one's life to such an extent that one can't even imagine anymore what it would be like without it. Now we use the absorptions, which is samatha or samadhi, to gain insight. That is essential. And I will explain all that as soon as we start, uh, get to that. And tomorrow we still have one other step of the uh, seven factors of enlightenment, but then we can get on with it with explaining the jhanas, which are four of the seven steps of the factors of enlightenment. What more can one say? It's a lost art. It's not being taught. It's a great pity. But the more I talk about it, the more people get interested. A man from, um, I keep forgetting his name, Wes Niska. I keep calling him Nikas, but that's no good. <laughs> Niska. He came here and he want, gave, wanted an interview and 
came right out and asked me about the jhanas. And I told him in an hour and a half, which I'm sure he can't print, an hour and a half of talk, exactly what it's all about. So maybe more people will understand that this is part of the practice, no matter what you do. And the interesting aspect was that when I talked to him, and he's a long-time meditator apparently, I've never met him before, so very nice person. So long-time meditator, he said that he had done it totally unaware of what's going on and uh, not having any support system to do it properly and uh, uh, cons in uh, consecutively, but just happening. And for all long-time meditators, it just happens. And since they don't know what to do with it, the guidance is necessary. Why nobody talks about it? Yes, they give all sorts of reasons. But the most compelling reason is, I think, I'm only guessing, I haven't asked them, I haven't met any of these teachers. I think the most compelling reason, and that's a guess, is that Mahasi Sayadaw called it, uh, or um, put it into the Ten Corruptions of Insight. And because it's found there, then, of course, it was never taught, so they don't know what to do with it. But since it's found there, the uh, things that are being said about it, oh, you get attached to it. Well, we had that already. It's better than cigarettes, we said, huh? and better than ice cream, and all these other attachments that we run around with. Better than the attachment to this body, what do I look like? And what am I going to wear? And uh, is my hair all right? And all the rest of that. If you get to get attached, get attached to something that might eventually lead to Nibbana. <laughs> <laughs> the attachment is an old chestnut. Anybody who does it, no, not, uh, no that's an exaggeration, practically anybody who does it, knows very well that they are for the purpose of insight and also for the purpose of enlightenment. And it's very rare to find somebody that does a jhanas, a meditative absorptions, that isn't bent on enlightenment. It may never happen in this lifetime. That's not the criteria. Of course, there are some people who are satisfied with that, sure. There are some people that are satisfied with watching television. In fact, there are lots of people that are satisfied with that. <laughs> so it depends on one's tendency. But these are not uh, valid reasons. The valid reason to do them is because the Buddha did them, the Buddha taught them. In the Majjhima Nikaya number 68, he says, this is a pleasure I will allow myself. If you want to know what he really said, read the Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle End Sayings. It's a brand new translation, or I should say, a brand new edition. It was translated by the Venerable Jnana Moli, an English monk, and Bhikkhu Bodhi, an American monk living in Sri Lanka, has uh, re-edited that translation in four years of labor, and it has just been published by Wisdom Publications. It's uh, about that thick on very thin paper, so you've got practically years of reading. <laughs> Don't read it like a book, read it like a, a teaching situation and you will find the jhanas over and over again. And these are the discourses of the Buddha. The Middle End Thing contain 152 discourses and they are called the Middle End Things because they are not very short, not very long, that's all. That's the whole reason for calling them that. If you want to know why your particular teacher doesn't teach the jhanas, ask him or her. You will get some answer, I'm sure. But that's most important to know the difference, what you're doing. Are you doing samatha or are you doing vipassana? Samatha to get quiet and peaceful and Vipassana, to gain some insight into yourself. And with that, I might also mention one particular aspect of Samatha. 
Imagine you're standing in the ocean and the waves are going high. What can you see when you're standing there? Nothing but water. You're standing under the waves and they're going high. They're going on top of you. If you want to see what's at the bottom on the ocean floor, those waves have to subside before you can see anything. It has to be a totally calm surface. And then you can look and you can see the sand and the coral and the fish. It's the same with inside. As long as the thoughts and the emotions are moving about, the depth is invisible. That's why Samatha and then Vipassana. Can we do the meditation on the body, sensations, lying down, if we're not sleepy? I usually answer to that, when you wake up, you'll know why you can't do it that way. (laughs) Very common question. But if you can't fall asleep at night, if you have difficulty sleeping, please do it. It's excellent for that. Just start and then the next morning you might remember how far you got before you fell asleep. When I'm meditating, I become aware that I do not really exist. This feels fine until I start to feel sad and scared about not existing as an I. I have difficulty making sense of all this. Do you have any suggestions? Well, the thing to do is when the uh, uh, scared and sadness arises to investigate what one is attached to. And these attachments are like very strong rubber bands. They keep pulling one back. Now one may be very attached to the idea of that this body is me. One may be very attached to one's children, to one's partner, to one's abilities, to one's job, to one's um, bank account, to one's friends, uh, no end. One is particularly attached to one's identifications. I'm woman, I'm man, I'm clever, I'm stupid, I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm fat, I'm thin, I'm beautiful, I'm ugly, the whole gamut. So find out what's the attachment, what are the rubber bands that hold you tight in samsara. Sadness and scaredness can only arise because the mind is not ready to let go. And having found the attachment, investigate whether it's worthwhile. And if the mind says, yes, of course, I have to be attached to that, that's fine. That's it then. Then the feeling of not me has arisen because there was concentration and not thinking. But it's not the same as having been able to let go. What's the difference between part-by-part meditation and sweeping meditation, or is there a difference? No, it's exactly the same. Um, I use the word part-by-part when I um, teach the other, the same thing, but in a a little different way, which we then call the full sweep. So it's it's exactly the same. It's just sweeping, doing it part by part to give it a nice um, exact description. It's the same thing. I study and try to follow what I understand and feel. Are there... Sorry, what is it? Are there... Are there something? Are there cons of the teachings of the... Hmm? Why can't I read that? Are the cores, are the cores of the teachings of the Buddha and of Christ. Please comment on what conflicts and harmonies you see in this double practice. Well, I wouldn't recommend that as a practice. Um, What I would say is that one needs to practice one to the point where one can really understand the other. And then one can see that in essence 
all the spiritual teachings lead to the same goal. It's a mountain, a very high mountain, and there are several guides that can lead one up that mountain, and they use different approaches to that same mountain, but they're all trying to get to the top of the mountain. So I wouldn't recommend using two approaches to the same mountain. I would be not only uncomfortable, but very, very time-consuming. Imagine you're climbing up a mountain and you're hopping from one uh, pathway to the next and then back to the first one and then to that one again. I mean, it's not only time-consuming, but it's also dangerous because you might fall down in the, in the middle of this hopping around. I would say that the only way to deal with that is to know one approach fully. And having understood it and known it and practiced it, then one can see that the other approach is just as valid. But practicing both, I think, would be extremely difficult. And I don't think that it would be uh, so successful either. Because what one would find if one hasn't really had the insight into one completely, one would be comparing. And that's a total waste of time. And I might have said that already, but if not, I'll say it now, or I'm going to repeat it. Don't compare what you hear and what you do. Just do it. It's the same here. This leads to comparisons. And comparisons are judgments. We are already burdened with so many judgments. I like it, I don't like it. I want to do it, I don't want to do it. This one's right, that one's wrong. It doesn't help. I only sit once a day with regularity. How often should I do the sweeping meditation? Well, what we're going to do at home, we'll discuss on the last day. Um, but generally speaking, if the concentration is good on the sweeping and not so good on the breath, do more of that, and, um, or vice versa. So um, that's a, just a general statement, but we'll discuss what we can do at home on the last day. Many people who care for the acute, acutely ill and dying, dying patients, um, become emotionally depleted. Uh, please comment on this in relation to our practice. We had a same sort of question, very similar anyway, on Sunday. I don't think you were there anymore. Um, burnout very common and happens particularly in the helping professions um, and even more particularly when one is um, dealing with um, a very ill people or dying people. The reason for the burnout is result thinking, achievement syndrome. Those people that are dying are not going to do us a favor not to die. And we find a lot of doctors and a lot of nurses who have that burnout symptom. It's just that they want to get some, see some result of their labors. But that's wrong thinking. And they're only hurting themselves with that. Now we are geared towards achievement syndromes. From the time we went to kindergarten, they give us numbers and notes and things, how good we are or how bad we are. It doesn't work. When one is helping, the help already is the result. At that moment, when we're doing something good, out of the kindness of the heart, that's enough. Whether that person will survive one day, one month, one year is of no consequence whatsoever. We are all going to die. 
absolutely guaranteed. It's only a matter of time. Nobody has ever managed not to. We won't either. So whatever these people that one is helping, whatever their uh, lifespan may be, the actual help at the moment, that's all that counts. So if a person is in that helping profession or is particularly helping people who are very ill, that has to be the main consideration to be in this moment. And the karmic resultant is also in this moment, having been able to relieve maybe some pain or some tension or having been able to be with that person so that they don't feel alone and lonely. That's reward in itself. That's enough. We don't need any other results. And the whole difficulty arises out of wanting results. One of my students in Germany is an oncologist, and he was on the point of giving the whole thing up. He couldn't handle it any longer because he never has any success. They're all dying on him. So we discussed this at length, so now he's trying again. And the Buddhist teaching really made a big uh, difference there. He, has a, he works at one of the universities,